Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, and I'm here at the Bloomberg Equality Summit with Dr. Tony Fauci from the NIH. Uh, Dr. Fauci, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So I want to just ask a couple upfront questions about the uh, coronavirus situation, then we'll get into some equality issues if we can. So today, um, the, the Department of Health and Human Services says that its plan is to have everybody vaccinated by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Uh, in your view, is that realistic? You know, that is possible, David, but to get everyone vaccinated, I think logistically, that is gonna to be tough. I mean, there will be tens of millions of doses available by the end of the year and in the first quarter. As you get to the end of the first quarter, there'll be hundreds of millions of doses. Whether or not you can get injection into everyone, and remember, it depends on what the vaccine is. If it's the Moderna vaccine, it's a prime followed by a boost 28 days later. So I think we need to be careful. It will be aspirational to do that, David, but I think it's more towards the middle to the end of the year that you could get people vaccinated. And are you reasonably confident that by the end of this year, this calendar year, uh, a one, more, one, two, or three vaccines will have been approved by the FDA? Well, yeah, will we'll, we'll have been made available in the sense of either by the formal approval or by an emergency use authorization. But to repeat your question with a, with a firm answer, by the end of 2020, namely November or December, I feel reasonably confident that there will be one or more vaccines that will be begun to be being made available to the American public. And do you believe that the process for approving the vaccines has been politicized such that um, Americans might be nervous about whether they have been uh, approved too soon? Well, the, none have been approved yet, David. There is certainly a lot of talk and concern about politicization of the process of approval. But as I always point out to people, there are so many levels of checkpoints to mitigate against political interference with that. I think one of the most important is that there is a data and safety monitoring board, which is an independent board not beholden to the government, to the FDA, or to the companies that analyze the data and talk about safety and whether or not it's deemed to be effective. At that point, those data, David, will ultimately become public. So if there is a chance, which I do not think will happen, about an end run to pressure premature approval, I think that will become readily apparent and transparent to people because there are a number of checkpoints, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, there are advisory committees to the FDA, and the FDA has pledged publicly in multiple editorials that they will not let any political considerations get involved in their decision to make the vaccine available. So I am gonna take them for their word. Okay, so is the Coronavirus White House Task Force still meeting regularly? Are you still part of that? Uh, yes, I am, David. Our last meeting was yesterday. Uh, we had a meeting at the White House in the Situation Room. We are not meeting as frequently as we used to, because remember back in the late winter, early spring, we were meeting essentially seven days a week. Right now, we're meeting probably one or two days a week. Hey, you have been quoted recently as saying that you thought maybe we can get back to normality in terms of uh, living our lives the way we did a year or two ago by the end of 2021. Is that still your view? It is, David. I think it's going to be a combination, and, and this relates to the question you asked me a moment ago, that if we can deploy and get vaccines distributed throughout the country by the end of 2021, and we combine that with a continuation of a certain level of the public health measures, I believe we can approach and perhaps you know, reach a degree of more uh, of uh, normality that closely resembles what we had before this particular outbreak occurred. Now, you have become very popular. There are bobbleheads all over the United States, enormous numbers of bobbleheads and T-shirts for Tony Fauci and so forth. So um, you've become popular because you've been willing to say what you really believe. Um, have you ever thought during this whole process that it, that it just wasn't worth the effort? and you've never thought about quitting and just saying, I'm going home and do something else. Is that correct? 
Well, th that is absolutely correct, David. This is such an important issue. I mean, I'm a physician, a scientist, and a public health person. This is what I do. I mean, this this is my my career. I mean, the idea about walking away in any way from the most important and impactful uh, outbreak in 102 years, I mean, since the 1918 pandemic, no matter what the stress or strain is, the thought has never entered my mind to abandon this or walk away from it. It's just too much of a challenge, not only to the United States, but to the entire world. Now, you've headed the Division of Infectious Diseases uh, at the NIH since 1984. So is this the biggest challenge you've ever seen for the uh, in your career? You know, uh, David, if you're talking about the impact in a concentrated period of time and the potential implications for the entire population of the world, the answer to that would be yes. I think you always have to ask about HIV AIDS, which already we know now, you know, has killed, you know, tens of millions of people and continues to infect people throughout the world at a very high rate. That has been over a period now since 1981, uh, 39 years. Uh, but when you talk about the concentrated explosion of a pandemic that essentially can involve virtually anybody and everybody on the planet, the answer to your question, yes, this is the most difficult thing that we have faced in a very con constrained period of time. Now, one of the challenges you personally faced was you had a, a polyp on your throat and couldn't talk for a while. Uh, that surgery has been done. Is your throat okay now? Yeah, it's back to normal. In fact, there are some people who've even texted in saying, is that really Dr. Fauci? It certainly doesn't sound like him. This is my normal voice, but the very scratchy voice that we had even on some interviews that I had with you, hopefully is gone forever. Good. So let's go to some equality issues. Uh, there's been concern uh, that in, uh, as the virus has moved forward, the people who have been most adversely affected are often minorities. African-Americans, for example, in a higher percentage than whites are being affected by COVID-19. Why is that? And why have they died at a higher percentage than whites have? You know, that's a good question, um, David. And the answer is really quite disturbing. There's almost a double whammy on the minority populations. First, on the basis of the jobs that they as a broad group hold, put them out in contact on the front line with people and don't allow them in many respects, for most of them, to be able to do the kinds of things that you and I are doing now through a computer in a safe way. So the nature of their jobs put them at a higher risk of getting infected in the first place. So they automatically start off at a disadvantage. Then when they do get infected, they have a much higher rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 than the uh, population in general, and certainly the white population. And the reason for that, David, relates back to the decades and decades old social determinants of health. They have a much higher incidence and prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, so that the very underlying comorbidities that predispose you to a serious outcome, such as hospitalization and death, are clearly much more prevalent in the minority populations. So let me ask you about a concern that has been expressed by the, an op-ed recently in the New York Times about whether people who are minorities are being adequately represented in the COVID-19 phase three trials. What can you say about that? Well, we are trying as best as we possibly can to get equitable representation of African-Americans, Latinx, and other minorities. We're doing better with the Latinx, but still we have to do much, much better with the relative percentage of African-Americans that are in the trial. It's a good reason for that, David, because when the trials ultimately get shown to be safe and effective with regard to the candidate vaccines, we want to be able to say with confidence that they are safe and effective in all demographic groups. You can make an assumption that they are, but we want to prove it by getting the equitable representation 
in the actual phase three trial itself. Now, there's a concern in the minority community, I believe, that when the vaccine is available, wealthy white people will get it first, and then it will trickle down, and the last people to get it will be minorities who might need it better or more than, than wealthy white people. What can you do to assure people that people of minority backgrounds will be getting this in the same fair way that it should be distributed? Well, there will be a prioritization. I mean, classically, notwithstanding COVID-19, whenever there is a shortage of vaccine in the sense of when you're rolling it out and you don't have all the doses, classically, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices advises the CDC who makes that determination about what prioritization is going to be done. We're complementing that with another group from the National Academy of Medicine, which has recently met to also give a recommendation. We don't know exactly what the decision is gonna be, but I can tell you, David, from past experience, clearly people who can benefit from the vaccine the most and those who are at the highest risk of serious complications will be in the higher priority. Almost certainly, the first priority will be the frontline workers the people such as the healthcare providers who put themselves at risk. But close behind them will very likely be people who could benefit the most, and almost certainly that would include minorities. Well, but minorities very often might be in the lower income strata. Suppose they say, yes, thank you for putting me at the front of the line, but I can't afford to get the vaccine. What are we going to do uh, as the U.S. government to make certain that people that can't really afford it uh, will get it? Yeah, well, you know, that was a very important question, David, and we were at the uh, task force meeting and said when we get asked that question, will the government make sure that that is not the case, that people who cannot afford it, as it were, first of all, people need to understand the vaccine itself is free. The federal government has pre-purchased those. So the vaccine itself is free. If there's any fee, it's going to be associated with the administrative aspects of administering the vaccine. And that should not be something that gets in the way of poor people receiving it. In the medical profession, I would say it's relatively not as represented as the population of minorities. Is there anything that's happened in the NIH to make certain that more people who are minority backgrounds work at the NIH or get trained to be medical doctors? Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of things, David, to try and and right that inequity that is still there. We're doing much better now than we were doing a few years ago, but as an organization, and particularly uh, the NIH director, Francis Collins, and all of the institute directors, including myself, are very seriously involved in doing whatever we can at every level, uh, at the entry level of fellows, people who are getting uh, a tenured, such as lab chiefs and even senior people who are at the leadership level. Obviously, we need to do better because when you look at the numbers, they're not where we want them to be yet, but it's certainly going in the right direction. Final question before uh, you leave, and I know you have another engagement. Uh, in, what can you do to assure the American people that you're going to stay healthy? Because I think most people want to make certain that you're going to be doing this for quite some time. So what are you doing to make certain that you don't get the virus and that you stay healthy? Well, I'm, I'm, regarding getting the virus, I'm, you know, essentially sequestered. I do almost everything, you know, uh, virtually, uh, except when I go down to the White House uh, for the task force meetings. I'm very careful. In the beginning of this, David, I did not take care of myself very well, particularly with regard to sleep. But, you know, I was trying to, trying to work, you know, an 18 to 19 hour day, which is kind of tough, but I'm trying with the advice and the firm hand of my partner in life, my wife, who is a very wise person, is making sure that I do that. So I think I'm going to be around, David. Hopefully we will have Good. more of these interviews. Thanks very much, and thank you for what you're doing for our country. And uh, I very much appreciate your being here today. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, anytime, David. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Anytime.